Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 74. This episode is Richard Gabai. And Richard is one of those people that does it all. He's an actor, director, producer, musician. I don't know how he contains it all. I really don't. But we talk about uh, how he got started in the industry from uh, this nationwide commercial that he did into Nightmare Sisters with Linnea Quigley. That's right. The scream queen herself, Linnea Quigley. Uh, he went on to make Virgin High, which is a hilarious, like, early 90s comedy. It's really funny. Uh, it's great. And also was Leslie Mann's first movie, so check that out. Um, and then we talk about what exactly a director does and what a producer does and a lot of behind-the-scenes processes of how movies are made. It's really, really fascinating. And then we go on to talk about, like, all the great movies he's made. And, guys, he's made some crazy stuff. Like, he did Popstar. If you remember, that's that Aaron Carter movie. Then we go on to Insight which is uh, this really, really good thriller that has, like, Sean Patrick Flannery, Natalie Zaya, Adam Baldwin, Christopher Lloyd, all in the same movie. I know. Yeah, and Richard did that, guys. Then he went on to make Justice, which is this awesome Western with Stephen Lang. But most recently, there's a movie right now on Hallmark called A Gingerbread Romance with Tia Morrow and Dwayne Henry. You heard me right. Tia Morrow from Sister, Sister. Yeah, she's great. The movie's great. If you need a holiday movie to watch while the family's in town, this is the one to do it, guys. Uh, Really, really fun talking to Richard, though. He's a super cool guy, and uh, he's got some great stories. So without further ado, please enjoy the interesting podcast episode number 74 with Richard Gabai. Theme song time. Very interesting. So, what? When did you move to LA? Then, if you're born in New York but spent a lot of time in LA, I, I actually had my I had my sixth birthday in Southern California. Oh, dude, same. Well, not same, but like at six was when I moved. <laughs> yeah, but I, as I said, I've been you know been back every year since, and um, you know, I have cousins and family in Manhattan, and a ton in a ton in Jersey, in New Jersey. Oh, okay, so, okay. See, you sound like you're from LA. <laughs> well, perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we. You know, the first time I went to, um, my wa- my wife happens to be French, but the oh, first right time, the well, first time we went to New York, um, she just and I and I exactly you know I know where I'm going and I walk fast. Yeah. Oh yeah. In New York, she <laughs> said I had no idea I was married to a New Yorker. That's funny. Is your family still in New York? Yeah, I mean my 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 mom and my brother are here, mm-hmm. um, but my um. And my dad was until a few months ago when, when he passed away. But my, oh, uh, no, thank you. My, all my cousins and aunts and uncles and, and stuff, they're all, they're all still back east. Some are actually in Florida. I have, um, really? I have a, I have a cousin and a couple of cousins in Florida. Right on, right on. Yep, dude, same boat. My entire family still in That's the natural, the natural m- migration from New York, New Jersey to Florida. Yeah, exactly. They're all here. So then when did the, the interest in acting start? That was from uh, you know a, a really early age. I mean, when when um, my brother and I were kids in the valley, we we goofed around and made Super Eight movies. And oh, sweet! A neighbor recommended this summer drama program that's at Cal State Northridge, which is in the valley here where we where we lived at the time, and actually where I live again. Mm-hmm. And um, so I went and did these summer programs where we put on musical theater, and I just fell in love with it. I just had so much fun. Sure. Sure. So did acting start so or did kid, music start? Acting did, started first. Okay. Okay. M- musical theater is like the good hybrid. I'm seeing a clear line here. Oh, man. <laughs> if you see a clear line about me, please share it with me because I've been waiting to figure out who yeah. I am. Um, <laughs> That's my job, Richard. Thank you for taking the time. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I – yeah, I actually it was it – was, it was acting that was first. Okay. And I um, – as a really little kid, I was – going to the mall to meet friends of mine and we were going to see a movie and we were obviously this is pre-cell phones and Mm -hmm. we were meeting at the mall in front of the movie theater 
and we were going to pick a movie to see. Anyway, I get to the mall, and for whatever reason, you know, our paths didn't cross. I mean, somebody picked the wrong time, or and there was no way to re- reach each other. And then I'm there by myself, and I, I saw all the posters of the movies that were playing. And I saw this poster of a guy with a guitar, and I just said, oh, you know, I'm going to go, I'll go see that. That looks cool. I've always been interested in guitar. I had played a, the piano a bit. Oh. And I, anyway, so it was the Buddy Holly story. Oh, sweet. <laughs> and um, as the movie ended, I, um, I noticed, I don't know how familiar you are with that film, but mm-hmm. a, as the movie ended, I touched my face and realized that tears were running down my cheeks. And oh, um, nice. I was a little, I was really a little kid. I don't remember. I'd have to do a lot of math to figure out exactly how old I was. But, yeah. Um, I was a really little kid. Like I would never let my kids at whatever age I was then walk to the mall by themselves. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but. Um, I kind of decided at that point, but I want to learn how to play guitar and making movies would be cool. Wow. The two, the, the, the there's, there's the line, Richard, right there. <laughs> there's the line. We found there's the catalyst. The <laughs> and then the, the, the story of when I actually met and worked with Gary Busey is an entire show. Gary yeah. Busey played oh. Buddy Holly in that film, but, Dude. um, that's an entire show, but, but yeah, so there's the line. And so, you know, I learned how to play guitar and then, you know, had the band in high school and, um, always kept singing and songwriting as part of my creative life, and mm-hmm. and I don't know how much you know you've read, but you know I played a bunch, I played all the nightclubs in L.A. and yeah. played with some pretty prominent bands, and and actually had some major opportunities. But I would always kind of get a movie, and then decide I wanted to do the movie, and you know, life kind of has taken me on a really fun and interesting path. Yeah, yeah. That well, that's what I like talking about uh, talking to people that are like yourself, which. Like an artist, but like with so many avenues, you're like, I just need to get this out. You know, you're like actor, director, producer, musician. And like, it's such an interesting thing to combine the acting with the producing side as well. But music is like its own sort of thing. Uh, And guitar was something I could never pick up. I played bass for a few years because that's only four strings. But guitar is hard. You know, it's hard to find. it's, It's hard to find a bass player. Yes, yeah. And there's no, and there's nothing sadder than a bass player without a band. Tell me about it. That's the name of my <laughs> memoir. <laughs> <laughs> the Brian Ballant story, bass player without a band. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, behind and and behind every, you know, amazing bionic actress uh self-starter that I would meet, she was inevitably dating a bass player without a band. You know, we just connect, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. <laughs> We're just looking for that next one. And that's completely a joke. There was only one like that. So that yeah. <laughs> just, it, it, it has become a, a line for me whenever a buddy of mine would tell me, I met this girl, she's so amazing. And I'm like, don't tell me she's dating a bass player without a band. Yeah. It, <laughs> it, became, it sometimes like, just makes sense. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's amazing. Exactly. We all find our own misery somehow. That's right. But I'm, 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 really, I'm really fortunate to have been able to make a living in the arts, and I kind of see that as the big victory, not that – I've become a superstar in any single one of those avenues, but I think if I had, on a practical, in a practical sense, had I focused on just one through my entire career, maybe I'd be farther advanced than that one. But I, I'm know. highly, highly confident that I wouldn't be happier. And um, for sure, you know, it's it's been a business of opportunity for me, and it's always been a business to me. It's always been how I made my living. Sure. It wasn't like I was trying to repair a tarnished childhood or anything. I'm very <laughs> right. blessed. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, but a lot of people need that. A lot of people need artistic expression to, as a form of therapy. And I, yeah. I was blessed enough to grow up in an extremely normal middle class home. Awesome. You know, with parents who were married for fifty-eight years, and Dude. you know, I always had food on my table. I was never the first kid with the new toy, but then again, I, you know, I had clean, nice clothes and food, and you yeah. know, nothing to complain about. So I, I'm not, I'm not in recovery for any kind of, you know. Sure. Damage. Probably. It's best. always been what I, it's always been what I wanted to do. So I'm lucky. Sure. I'm lucky. I agree. I agree. But then that's the other thing is like luck will only get you in the door. You know, it's like work ethic and talent and skill keeps you there. So it's like it's good that you have the luck, but you also got some stuff to you there, man. Like you, you've well, been thanks. working and for I, a reason. And I think getting in the you know, honestly to, to tell you the truth, I think getting in the door really takes the work. Yeah, well. I agree with what's that like overnight successes or ten years in the making or something like that. Like it's oh man, I am way behind, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've been at this for well over twenty, you know, yeah. more well over twenty years, or thirty years. And um, I mean, fair. Um, but but yeah, but yeah, absolutely. But I, I think it is a 
definitely there are a lot of tortoise and hare scenarios. I remember um, many years ago, friends of mine who had become extremely successful, you know, within within five or six years Mm -hmm. were kind of saying, you know, Richard, you know, what happened? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And unfortunately, many of those people that were oh so successful, you know, 10 years ago are no longer in the business. And here I still am. So. We'll see if it's right. a tortoise and a hare scenario. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I mean, so far so good. You know, you keep. I'm man. I'm man. I'm very. Stuff. I'm very grateful. Luckiest guy I know. For sure. So do you do you play anything else or just guitar at this point? Um, I I think I can. The only thing that I'm fairly confident at is guitar. I do enjoy playing some keyboards and stuff. When I made my record last year, I did play yes. some keyboards. Congrats on that, by the way. Thank you, thank you. I'm I'm really proud of that record. It it um. You should be. I, it's good. I really enjoyed it. It's got old school kind of feel to it. I'm into it, man. Thanks, thanks. And one of the things I did, I, you know, because I've done some recording over the years, mm-hmm. and I never, I was always, you know, around somebody who I felt was a better lead guitar player. Sure. So when I would make a record, I would have somebody else play the leads. And I just made a conscious decision when I made this record with the help of the great Cal Campbell engineering oh. and helping me produce it, um, that I was going to sing every part. Mm-hmm. And I was going to play every single freaking guitar, and I, I have an obscene—I have an obscene guitar collection. If really? I was nearly as good as my guitar collection, I would be, you know, right up there with you know Eric Clapton or whoever you think is the greatest, Brian May, whoever the, you yeah. think the greatest guitar player is. But I'm not. But I do have this awesome guitar collection, and I used like 13 or 14 of my guitars on that record. Wow! And I played every single guitar on the record, and and with Cal's help in terms of, you know. Getting giving me which notes to hit to make those harmonies happen. I did sing all the vocals too. So what, dude? Yeah. Well, yeah. Done. He 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 had me um hitting notes I didn't know I could hit. You know that's what a good producer does. Yes, for sure. Dude, that's nuts. Also, oh, but I had great. I mean, I had great players on it. I mean, yeah. Um, uh, Tom Walsh, who's one of the greatest session players in Los Angeles, played the drums and. My friend Rick Lawrence on bass, and my friend Patrick Ross, who literally is one of the best fiddlers in yeah. the business, played on the record, and and Jim Wheeler, who's a touring great sax player, played the saxophone. So I I had plenty of and um, plenty of plenty of players, and and Stuart Brawley, who's a actually a friend a friend of a friend, came on in the, in the zero hour and laid in some keyboards and did the mix. Dude. So it really was a lot. There's a lot of talent on that record, but there are no guitars that are not mine, and there are no vocals that aren't. That's mine right. Either. That is right. Man, dude, that's nuts. Any any form of collaborative art, I think, is just magic. You know, it's like getting anything made at all is impossible. Getting it made and it being good is that much more so. And somehow I, you've been doing it both for a while. So kudos. Thanks, man. And I'll, I'll tell you, that's one of the things that I enjoy the most as well. And one of the things I always say about film is that. Mm-hmm. film and television we can't we're not shooting film anymore uh, motion right. pictures ah uh, yes of course <laughs> motion pictures and with sound and music is that it is the most collaborative of the arts in my view and I agree. you know it's and and when 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 the projects come out really good the director gets too much credit and when they don't come out good the director gets too much blame yeah <laughs> i agree with that it's very so, true yeah yeah i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts yeah, for sure. I've had a lot of people uh, that are like creature performers for the new Star Wars movies on my show before, and it's uh-huh. amazing that like each one of those characters has a team of like seven people that's like doing the hair. One person's in their uh, in their ear on a microphone to tell them where to go, and the other person's operating the puppet's eyes. And like, it's crazy how many people are involved in making a movie. Uh, well, you're right. Especially a Star Wars film, I'm sure it goes into the thousands. Oh, it's insane, man crazy and just like visual effects as well it's a whole other thing it's like this one shot of this movie took like 25 people like mother of god that's insane and months of time and months of months time. of time exactly exactly so what was uh what was your first acting gig was it nightmare sisters because if it is we need to uh, talk about it well we can talk about nightmare sisters anyway we should talk about it regardless good it was certainly, <laughs> it was certainly important to me but my actual first my first gig was a movie that was shot in Sharon, Pennsylvania called The Whitmores Are Having Company, I which like was it. kind of a dark comedy Christmas movie. Makes sense. And so I, I simultaneously got my first acting gig and went on location as wow. like a really young dude. And I went, I went on location to Sharon, Pennsylvania for a month or five weeks. I don't remember what it was. Dude. And um, it was awesome. And I, and I met, actually met a couple of, of friends there that I ended up collaborating with for many years. Most of which, all of which, actually, I'm still in touch with to to this day. 
And then when I came back, not long thereafter, I think I, I, bu- I booked, I think, the National Old Milwaukee Beer Commercial, Perfect. which was a really great gig. I think huge. in terms of my first, like, professional gig, I would say that was it because it was sure. kind of huge and a shot at Dodger Stadium. and What? And I'm, yeah, shot at Dodger Dude. Stadium like, with, like, a, you know, hundreds of extras back before they could CG an entire crowd. And, right. You know? <laughs> The heat was on on that one, but but um, and I and I you know I made really good mo- good money on that. And, sure, but not not that. And then Nightmare Sisters came up. So, dude, um, Whitmore's are having company. Kind of, I don't know that it ever even came out in the U.S. It was released overseas under the title Night Visitors, mm-hmm. and um, Nightmare Sisters, which is you know a exploitation classic. Oh yeah. Uh, um, that that was you know shot in four or five days and you know it was really out on DVD within uh, I don't know months of when we shot it so wow it was it was finished before uh, before that first movie I did wow oh, okay that, <laughs> that was an amazing an amazing time and and um, I'm really grateful for that experience not just because it was fun and I was you know like 20 years old and there's you know gorgeous babes everywhere but yeah. Um, because I, I saw that you can make a movie in four or five days. Sure. And, and I, I asked David Dakota, the director producer, I was like, how much did this movie cost? And he said $40,000. So in my brain, I just said, well, so that if I raised $40,000, I could make my own movie. Oh, nice. And I sat down over a weekend and wrote Assault of the Party Nerds. Oh, sweet. And, and um, on a typewriter, by the way. Of course. As you and, do. Um, <laughs> and... And raised forty thousand dollars, and then made that movie. So that kind of it was really it was really kind of formative and educational. And um, sure, it's funny know. how that stuff snowballs. You know what I mean? It's like when you you have to see it to believe it sometimes, and once you see it, you start to believe it, and then that just kind of turns into other things. It's pretty nuts how stuff works like that. Every now and then, everything works out. Yeah, it's true. Things come full circle. That's, there's some speaking there's some lights of, in the path. Yes, exactly. Speaking of, in Nightmare Sisters, you worked with the Scream Queen, Linnea Quigley, who's super awesome. And like at that time, you know, it's the the Scream Queen era. And then you and then you made this movie. I don't remember how I saw it. I was probably too young. Um, but you had great hair in Virgin High. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, I was <laughs> I, I might have been too young to make it, <laughs> but uh, but I do. I love uh, Virgin High. Is oh yeah, I had a full on, full on like it's like a mullet kind of Springfield. Yeah, mullet. Yeah, it was amazing. And, <laughs> and a lot of my, a lot of my, uh, a lot of the uh, cut from my first album are on, in that movie. The, all the songs are my soundtrack. Are my first band, The Checks. Yes. Um, that was a great experience. I mean, that I I love that movie, and it was a. Uh, um, Kind of brown groundbreaking at the time. I mean, it was shot on thirty five millimeter film and finished the stereo answer printed one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Dude, and it was picked up by Columbia Pictures and you know played in prime time on HBO back when HBO only had one channel. Right, you know? right. <laughs> and and you know when it was released by Columbia Pictures in those days they were releasing two movies on video per month. Mm-hmm. And and I still have the sales sheet from that. And on on the left side there's a picture of me. And Linnea in Virgin High, and on the right side of the cell sheet is Marlon Brando and Matthew Broderick in The Freshman. Oh, dude. so I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of an amazing contrast, an amazing irony, and and a great honor to be in the same you know two page sales flyer with Marlon Brando and Matthew Broderick, and uh, yeah, and that, that's when you know VHS test, VHS tapes were being sold for like seventy nine ninety five, and yeah, for real. It, I would, you know, I would. I remember being in the mall with my mom to buy a suit, and the salesman recognizing me because it was a much smaller world then. You know, there was right there was network TV and HBO. So if Virgin High was on at eight PM on a Saturday night, anybody who had HBO was watching Virgin High. Sure, sure. And um, so, like the the salesman recognized me, and my my mother was just, you know, <laughs> so impressed. With, it, it made it all worth it to me. It was made yeah, my there day. you go. <laughs> you start asking now for discounts. You know, the good news. The good news now is that uh, the good news is anyone can make a movie now, and the bad news is anyone can make a movie now. For real. And the, and the same thing with distribution. I mean, anyone. The good news is anyone can get distribution, and the bad news is anyone can get distribution. So there's 80 billion things on at any given moment. You're right. Absolutely right. And Linnea Quigley was also in Virgin High as well as Nightmare Sisters. 
And I, I actually was in a movie with her last year. Wow. She's still kicking it around, man. Oh yeah. I, I ran into her recently. Um, and, um, in fact, just last not last just last week, I had lunch with Michelle Bauer, who's been kind of oh a lifetime sweet, pal. yeah, dude, that's good. That's good stuff. And and I'm I don't know if it was her first role, but Leslie Mann had a bit part in Virgin High. Well, Leslie Mann, it was her first part, and Man. I I discovered her on that, and she what? came as an extra. She came as an extra, dude. And she was just one of the extras, and she was sort of lined up with a bunch of other girls in those Catholic girl plaid skirts. Mm-hmm. And she, I look, she she looked at me, and I looked at her, and she just had this spark. And it's the oldest Hollywood story in the book. But I was just like, who the hell is this? This girl's, you know, she just lit up. Yeah. And I went and said hello to her, and she said hi. And she had this <laughs> voice. <laughs> oh my god, this girl is she's she's a twelve out of ten with this great comedic voice, and she was instantly really funny. Yeah, yeah. So I I literally said to her. If I write a little couple of lines, do you want to have a couple of lines in the movie? And she said, oh, my God. And um, so at lunch, I wrote, I don't know how well you remember the movie, but that little bit where she has that line and raises her hand. I, <laughs> yeah, I wrote that at lunch, and I, I knew it was just ridiculous, but I just, <laughs> in those days, you could kind of do whatever you wanted to do. Oh, yeah, you know? for sure. And it was funny. I mean, it is funny. It I is funny. Ex- <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny. I, don't, I can't explain it. It's just funny, and I thought it was funny, and. And then, you know, she actually did that line and she was really excited about having a credit on the IMDb. Oh, yeah. And um, and and and, um, you know, she was in a movie a few years ago Mm -hmm. uh, and she was on that late show with the host. I can't remember right now. Not with like a couple of her co-stars. It's on like it's on Bravo. Uh, Andy Cohen. Yeah, she yep. was on with Andy Cohen and a couple stars, and he punked her with that cl- clip from Virgin High. Oh, sweet. <laughs> it was freaking awesome. It was awesome, and they showed the whole clip, and Andy Cohen's like, who's that guy? He's cute. And she, was, <laughs> she was turning colors. I I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Dude. I mean, now she's Leslie Mann. I mean, come on. She's Leslie Mann. She's she's uh, Leslie Mann. What can I tell you? She's married to the most talented, powerful guy in Hollywood, right? Right. And killing it. <laughs> so, yeah, good for her. So when you started acting, when did you decide to, like, I'm going to try to direct? Or was that just, like, if I'm going to make a movie, being inspired by the budget and time constraints of the previous one, were you like, I could do this, and then just decided to go directing as well? Like, how did how did you make the jump yeah. from acting to up to directing? I just decided to because I, um, I, you know, I was just raised with a work ethic. And sure, same. I was kind of... You know, I had done that beer commercial, and at those times when you got, like, a national commercial, and then I got another commercial, and I was lucky. I mean, I was, I was sitting on my couch in my apartment in Hollywood eating grapes and pretzels. The life. Catching checks, <laughs> and, but, like, waiting for the phone to ring to go to another audition. It just didn't seem like how I was going to spend my life. Right. And um, I just, you know, I did. I had done that movie, and I just decided, well, if I could... If he did it for forty thousand dollars, if I write a script and raise forty thousand dollars, I can go make a movie, and that's really exactly what I did. And Dude. and the movie stars me and my friends with you know Linnea and Michelle and mm-hmm. uh, cameo from the now deceased but former big star Troy Donahue from the sixties. Oh yeah. And um, I just I literally wrote it on a typewriter with my friend my friend Michael Becker, longtime colleague, producing partner, assistant director. He literally was sitting next to me, and we put all the scenes. He helped me organize it. We put every scene that I was going to write on an index card. Oh, sweet. And over a weekend, I wrote every scene one at a time on a typewriter. Perfect. And then we just made, literally, yeah, literally just made the movie. And we Dude. rented a flatbed, which is, and you can all look up what a flatbed is, you know, <laughs> was, to edit film. And we edited the film in, in his apartment. We literally had film taped around the walls of his apartment and cut it together. And the rest is um, wow, cult genre movie history. I mean, that movie's been re-released, I think, five or six or seven times. And I have a couple of companies that want to put it out on Blu-ray. I just haven't gotten around to dealing with it yet. But Sure. There you have it. So, That's yeah, it was, just, it was just a decision. I just wanted to do more. I, I wanted to, you know, I'm also, you know, I love business. I love, you know, making deals and sure. working with people. So that, so that makes that sense. Was, kind of it that fits why you're doing so well because that's sh- sh- out of show business what's the bigger word you know man oh, it's, a, it's a business that's for sure 
That's nuts, though. So, I mean, dude, you just did it. That That's pretty... You So you said a term before uh, that I really, really like, where you said you're a blue-collar filmmaker, because there's so much of, like... There's so many good movies out there, like indies or what have you, that it's like there's so much work involved in it, and it's not all, like, the top of the top and nothing else. You know, like, they're, like there are working actors that do it for a living, but you don't know who they are. But it's still a viable means of income it's just cool that there's this other side well certainly it certainly can be and why you know i've i've always been kind of skating below the radar i mean obviously you've done your homework and you know you actually know you know who i am and what i've done and Mm -hmm. but but you know there's i can you know whenever i'm i'm in a conversation with somebody who doesn't know me i mean they've you know these lifetime films that i've directed and a couple of the bigger projects that i've worked on and and thankfully, this this latest Hallmark film that I directed that people yes. will have seen and maybe heard about. But in general, they in general they haven't heard about most of the stuff I've worked on. And um, and in general, they'll ask me if I know somebody in the business, and I inevitably don't know them. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because <yeah. laughs> uh, I have a yeah, I just have a kind of working man's career in the entertainment business between the music and the and the um, acting and the directing and the producing. It all it all pieces together to me. Uh, thankfully, living a really nice life. Yeah, I love it, man. So, like, what exactly, for people that don't know, what is, what does a director do and what does a producer do? Because I feel like those terms get lumped in a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and not, the average person won't be like, oh, like when a lot of people like, oh, I really love the directing of this shot, when it's actually the cinematography. You know what I mean? It's stuff like that. So what, are, what does a director do and what does a producer do that people don't necessarily know? Well, you went to director and cinematographer because I think those are – you know, the director and the cinematographer work together to decide yes. what what shots they're going to make and how they're going to frame mm-hmm. each scene and how, you know, but in general, the director is, works with the actors and the crew to tell the story that was written in the script. He directs. <laughs> he directs. He directs. And generally, the producer puts together the parts that the director needs to make the movie. Aha! Uh-huh. That makes so, sense. So, but you know, you can be on a, you know, you can be on a TV series, and the director's job is to fulfill the producer's vision. He's a mechanic more more so than a visionary. Oh, okay. So very so by the, the producers are you know the produ- yeah the producers will be watching the monitor and you know want their story told in a certain way. And not that the director is a robot, but you know it 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 really varies a lot by production. I mean, sometimes producers control everything they choose the wardrobe they choose all the cast they appro- you know they approve every every single thing all the way down to watching the monitor to make sure the director's making the movie the way they want him to right and <clears throat> hmm. all the way in the other direction where they you know the director is king and the director decides what's happening and the producers just feel so lucky to have hired this director to make his movie for him right know? right that makes a lot of sense actually but i mean and and, and with the director and cinematographer i think it it's always it's always different, you know. I um, sometimes a director will tell a cinematographer exactly what shots he wants, right? And the cinematographer will just do what the director wants. And then other times, where if you have a really accomplished cinematographer and has you know strong opinions, you might say, "Hey, you know, I don't like that idea. Well, let's do it this way." And then they'll come to you know an agreement. Sure, it's a much more collaborative process as opposed yeah, to just and like, this and is I, I like collaborating with I like collaborating with everybody because when I made my first movie, I I really kind of thought I had to decide everything, and I sat there with the editor when we made the the edit. Right. But I I realized quickly that by not being in the editing room, I already know how I want to edit the movie mm-hmm. that I shot. But by not being in the editing room, the editor is probably going to come up with some great ideas that I could steal. Yeah, you know? for sure. That makes a lot of sense. So, you know, I, when I'm starting on a film, there's always a few shots I have in my mind from reading a script. Like I, I transit the way I'd like to make some transitions work or, or um, whatever, a, a, a particular frame that I'd like to capture. Sure. But other than that, I really enjoy collaborating with the cinematographer and see, you know, see what he sees. You know? Right. I feel like that is the best way to do things as well because different people have different points of view and like when you bring them all together you can elevate the whole project as opposed to one person's singular view perhaps obviously it varies but I yeah I mean if, if it's if it's you know if I wrote if I when I write my manifesto 
Mm-hmm. Um, I might get some ideas from my cinematographer, but I have a feeling I'll know exactly how I want that film to look. Right, right. So, who knows? Yeah, exactly. And you know, I may, I may or may not ever do that. And um, it's amazingly, it's not, it's not a goal. I'm not, um, I'm not thinking about what's my one great movie. I just like going to work every day. And oh yeah, for know. sure, being able to work is pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> man. So did did you go to school for any film stuff, or you just kind of figured it out? Well, I. I went my first few years of college. Well, I would, you know, we made a couple of little movies when we were kids, but right. I watched movies my whole life. You know, my 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 father was a huge influence in terms of uh, developing my love for for cinema and the arts, mm-hmm. and my mom as well. And so, you know, you've watched enough movies, you kind of get it a little bit. Agreed. When I my first two years of college, I I I was a telecom and film major, but I was mostly doing general education. Right, and then. When I I moved, I switched to USC as a junior because I wanted to come back to LA to play in my band. Oh, nice! And I majored in journalism, and I oh nice really recommend journalism as a as a degree as a you know if you're going to get a bachelor of arts degree, I I really recommend journalism to everybody because it's so practical. Yeah, for sure. You learn practical skills that you use every day, or that I still use every day, even though I never worked as a journalist. Right. In fact, my oldest daughter is now applying to colleges, and she's she's unlike me though. She's exceptionally bright, <laughs> and she's going to get some kind of a bachelor of arts degree at first. And I really, you know, I recommended journalism as either a major or a minor, just because it's just so practical. Sure, you know, yeah, it makes sense. It show business and like journalism, any sort yeah, of yeah. No, no, like on that, the lines, on the, the lines of show business, when I was going to SC, I saw that if you went to the USC Cinema School, they owned any movie you made. Right. Even if you, even though you have to pay for it by yourself outside of tuition, mm-hmm. and that 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 rubbed my business that sense sucks. the wrong way. Yeah, I was like, no, nah, if I'm paying for it, I own it. You don't own it. Yeah, and, for uh, sure. I agree. And I really wanted to just play in my rock and roll band, and, and yeah. I, you know, boy, that's a and that's a hard major. I mean, who knows if I would even have gotten into the program, right? Right, right. You never know. Man, well, I mean, you did pretty well. <laughs> like I said, the path, even at this point, you're doing pretty all right for yourself. Not bad. Not bad at all. And then you did a movie that uh, I'm very interested in, all right, because I did see it when I was younger, because this was at the time of uh, when Aaron Carter is on top of the world. Um, Right. He made this movie. You made this movie called Pop Star. And I'm wondering, when you have such, like, a public figure like this, I mean, his older brother being in the Backstreet Boys and, like, I I was born in 91, so, like, the 90s was, like, the boy band time. You know, you got NSYNC and all that stuff. So, like... What was it like, and how did that movie come to be working with, like, Aaron Carter, and then Adrian Palicki's in it as well, who's amazing? Yeah, we kind of discovered Adrian Palicki. That was kind of her first real movie, and, and it was Dude. the tape. It was actually the, pa- the tape from Popstar that got her Friday Night Lights. What? Right. Look at you opening doors. Same, same, same kind of, same kind of, yeah, you can see it, though, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, but I, Aaron is a great kid not a kid anymore but he's a great guy Mm -hmm. i made some i was working for um a producer and he had this script and i read it and i really liked it and then we i had the idea of getting you know so there's three generations of pop stars in the movie right so you know david cassidy who was kind of the original teen pop star Mm -hmm. from the 70s played aaron's manager like david passed away last year it's kind of kind of sad he was a wonderful guy yeah and um and then, and Leif Garrett, who was kind of an seventies, eighties pop star, right? Right. Um, so is in it as the janitor at the high school. Love but it. Aaron was definitely. I mean, anywhere we went with Aaron, he just got mobbed. I believe it, especially at that time, man. Yeah, he was. He was. He was pretty hot at the time, and I mean, the movie's cute. He did a good job, and we had a lot of his songs on it. And, in it, and I and, and I'll I'll tell you, I was not at all a fan. But by the time I was done making the movie, I was a big Aaron Carter fan. Yeah. I still am. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I like those songs, and and he is a talent. He's a talented dude. Oh yeah, you got to be like a next level performer to be any sort of artist in that literally arena kind of stuff, you know. But he really can sing and play. I mean, he would sit sure. down at the keyboard and tickle those ivories and sing. It'd be wow, man. Yeah, like, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah you look at him you're like i get i get it yep this yeah two he's, plus two he's, just, he's great we had, we had a lot of fun making that movie and and 
it was shot in and around where I live right now. In fact, I don't know if you how well you remember the movie, but oh yeah, was it an actual we, school? Yeah, yeah, that what? was a middle school like a mile away from where I live. Um, and um, AC Stell in Calabasas, and and then I don't know if you remember there was a party scene that David Cassidy held. Yes, in the backyard. That's my backyard. Is it really? <laughs> I am looking at that pool right now as I sit here. Dude, <laughs> you've got yeah. your own bit of movie history. Well done. That's, Thank you. That's the magic of making movies, though. It's like when you see people and they film like three different scenes and you don't realize it's all the same room. Yeah. yeah. Well, we do that all. We do that all the time. But yeah, <laughs> that is great. I, I, I kind of it was kind of a last minute thing where I decided to shoot at my house, and I've I've never I've shot at my parents' house back in the day, but I never shot at my own house. And because I know what happens when we go into places and, and lo and behold, the next day I turn on my sprinklers and, you know, uh, something that was holding down a light went through a pipe and w- water was squirting everywhere. <laughs> I had no one to be mad at but myself. Right. <laughs> but it was a great location and it looked really cool. It looked really nice. It did. So what are the logistics of filming in an actual school then? That can't be easy. Well, it was during the summer. Oh, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot it, of sense. It was during the summer. We just, you know, I think they're. They're obligated to make it reasonable when they're not in session, and um, right, you know, you pay for security and major insurance and security deposit. But it looked really nice. I, I actually, you make me want to take another look at that movie because we I'm did a lot for. on that movie. We did a lot on that movie. Yeah, yeah. We shot at the beach. And a really funny thing from that and that movie is we were shooting in Malibu, and I spotted these dolphins right by the shore. Mm-hmm. And I said, quick, grab the camera. You know, my friend Katie <laughs> was operating camera, a steady cam. And we, we ran down to the beach and I grabbed Aaron and Alana, the stars. And we had them walk along the water and these dolphins are jumping and playing right behind them. Dude. And then I, I remember some like, you know, blogger or something on, on the internet. Cause you know, everyone can say anything they want on the internet. Oh yes. And, and they said, Oh, this movie as if it could get any cheesier then they had they they put dolphins playing in the background <laughs> behind them it was just so funny it was complete it, it was completely like the my, my friend michael goy taught me this uh, expression the illusion of intention so oh yeah things, things happen and you think that you think that it's right. you you planned it you yeah. planned it but it, it just so happened that i spotted these dolphins right off the shore and i said Let's run down there and shoot those things. This is beautiful. And then <laughs> someone commented, "Oh, that was so cheesy the way they put those dolphins in there." That's amazing. <laughs> that some people, man, though. It's like I remember the end of, I think it was Barton Fink, maybe, uh, with one of the Cohen brothers. They they filmed this like beach shot, and a seagull like flies across the screen, and there are like dissertations about what the seagull means. And, like, no, it's just a seagull. <laughs> Over analytical, man. It's like it has to mean something. There's there's multiple dolphins. What could it mean for their relationship in the movie? Right. Welcome to right. my TED talk. You know. Right. <laughs> but so you and then you went on to do an awesome movie that was so different from everything you've done before, uh, with also a crazy cast. Uh, in Insight, we need to talk about Insight. Well, Insight that is really, you dude. Know, one of my favorite. It might. It's probably my favorite film that we've made. I can understand that. I can understand that. How did How did this come to be? What a. Uh, because it's nothing like you've done prior to. It's so different from your previous work. Like, how did you attack a thriller like this? Well, it's more. You know, it's unlike anything I had ever made before. Right. But it actually is most like who I am. Oh. Okay. You know, I. You know, I didn't. Right, you know, for example, like getting Nightmare Sisters. I mean, that was an acting job for me. I went to an audition and they offered me a job, and I was going to be an actor when I grow up. And I, I said, "Well, I guess I'm growing up and taking this job." And right. nothing against Nightmare Sisters, but that in no way is related relatable to me as a human being. Right, right. Um, and and uh, while well, I remain grateful to this day that I had the opportunity and did it, you know what I mean? Definitely. But insight. Was, and I was always looking for a movie like Ins- you know, a movie like Insight. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Hitchcock. I'm a huge fan of thrillers. Yeah, same. Brian De Palma type movies. Oh, and all, yes. All, all this stuff. So, I my my cinematographer buddy Scott Peck had read this script, and it was 
I think to this day, the only time when I picked up a script and couldn't put it down. Sure. So I knew that it would re- attract good actors. And, and it boy did, did it. Dude. And, um, you know, we shot that. You know, we shot that movie in fifteen days on four hundred grand. What? Yeah. Good lord! Well so, done. Thank you. And um, wow. I love. I, you know, I, I, I again, like you were talking about it. I haven't watched it in a while. I really want to watch it again. <laughs> yeah. That that means I did my job right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, you know, Christopher Lloyd had done Call of the Wild, Call of the Wild 3D with me in Manhattan, yes. in, uh, Montana. And that was a that's a whole nother. We made the, you know, the first independent all digital 3D film that was released theatrically and all that. And we did that on on nothing. But mm-hmm. luckily, I mean, Chris is a very generous guy and became a good friend. So he, you know, he 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 was in insight for me as a as a favor at scale. And, really. Um, and um, dude, he killed you know, it. Uh, oh God, did he ever? Jeez. Well, he actually wasn't. He didn't kill it. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> um, but he was really, really good in the movie. Yeah. And what a score it was to have Natalie star in that thing. I mean, her performance is brilliant. Sean Flannery, who's a real good buddy of mine, um, Dude. was great. Everyone was great in it. Adam Baldwin. Adam Baldwin. Dude. All those. This cast. Like, how, how do you Veronica even wrangle Cartwright. that amount Veronica of Cartwright. Talent? I mean, like Veronica Cartwright's role. Yeah. That's. I'm going to say it, and people can write all kinds of weird things about me <laughs> as if they won't already. That she was, that was like an Oscar-worthy performance. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Acting is not easy <laughs> at all. No. So when you see people no. deliver, like like everyone in Insight, dude. Uh huh. Everyone dude. in Insight delivers. Yeah. How do you, how do you wrangle that level of talent as a director? <laughs> like, do you just, well when you're at I, that I, level? I, do you you, just hey, them? listen. When you when you have that level of talent, you don't wrangle. You just that get makes sense. Way. Just let just them do it, what they do. Get out of the way. Just get out of the way. Man. And I have to really hand it to um, Scott Peck, the cinematographer. Oh, yeah. Looked amazing. Who gave that film the atmosphere and the movement that we, we talked about. He nailed it. And and my you know post-production team, um, Jeff Murphy and his team who edited it, and, and the score, the music. Yeah. Mark, That's half Mark of a Carlo thriller, man. Defense. Yeah, Marcello, and and um, it, it really, you know, I'm, thanks for bringing it up. I'm, I I want to go watch that dang thing. I yeah. got a blue right there. Dude, you should be proud of it. I, no, so, I I am. I'm very very proud of it. I'm very proud of it. I love when there's like things come full circle in movies and whatnot because obviously I'm a big fan of movies, um, and I like when people that I really love are in other things. So I search for things like that. Oh, I love they were in this. What else have they done? Let me watch all of their work kind of thing because it's who I am and like this movie I mean dude you got Doc Brown one of the Boondock Saints you got Jane from Firefly like in the same movie wow yeah wow it, it does it's kind of unstoppable we have Jim I have Jimmy Olsen oh no Jimmy Olsen's in my other movie mm-hmm. um, Mark McClure was in my movie Imaginary Friend I'm blurring some lines here right because yeah. <laughs> um, I use that same location but um yeah, we have a lot of people in that film. My gosh. I know. Man, this is what I mean. See, the road, the track Rance is building ha- here. Rance Howard. Yes. As the preacher. Gosh, was he great in that scene. That was so creepy. Sheesh. You just, you're killing it, man. And then, as if it couldn't get any better, I am a massive fan of westerns. Okay. And Justice is one of those that, like, I just really, really enjoy the story, like the idea that it's after the Civil War and there are some people that aren't just going to accept the outcome. <laughs> and then you mm-hmm. get Stephen Lang, who's from quite possibly the greatest Western of all time, Tombstone. Mm-hmm. In your Western, and Robert Carradine, Jamie Lynn Sigler, like how, what? How fun was it to shoot a Western? Has to be the It best. was a dream come true. I believe it. A hundred percent. Like when I, when that, came to me through my friend a friend of mine recommended me to the producer of that film um the producer tony perez and nico mm-hmm. foster um my friend larry recommended me to them and i went and met um tony for a burger and i uh, you know i i was saying yes before i got to the meeting yeah. <laughs> i you know i didn't know if i had the job yet so um scott and i put together a lookbook for him and and um 
the long and short of it is it was a dream for me and it was even more fun than I thought it would be. You sure. know, we, we shot in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico at the Bonanza Creek ranch, which is kind of oh, the ultimate Western location dude. and, um, had the best wranglers, the best horses, the best crew. Um, it was, I mean, it was hard, man. It was, it was really, it was a tough shoot, sure. but it was so fun. I mean, at, at the end of the day, every day, you're just kind of covered in cowboy dirt. Yeah. You watch it <laughs> off and go, go back and do, do it again the next day. And the interesting thing about New Mexico is they have a lot of weather there. Like in the same day, it can be freezing cold and hot, really windy and rainy. And huh. we shot yeah. in April and, um, apparently in April, like every, every day at like three in the afternoon, it gets crazy windy. Oh, all right. And around like two forty five in the afternoon on the first day, some of the crew starts like putting like tarps on stuff and sure. moving stuff into the barn. I'm like, what's going on? They go, Well, it's gonna get really windy here in about twenty minutes. <laughs> he said, I don't know why you're trying to shoot a western in April. I said, I don't know. And then yeah. that's that scene when we were shooting that cavalry scene when the whole cavalry runs into the town and there's a big shootout. Yeah. And and um it was I mean a sandstorm, and it's amazing how it's not on camera. Yeah, and but the horses the kicking it up and the, and the stunt weather. man were. Wow. The, it was. It was not really the horses. It was just the wind. Just, yeah, just just the weather. And I'm I'm there with. Um, funny, just as we're talking, Sean Patrick Flannery is texting me. Tell him um, I said hi. <laughs> I will. Um, anyway, the the punchline is that the entire crew other than me and Scott, my DP, who's a camera, who was also operating camera. Love it. We're out, we're out in the middle of the town. We both have like ski goggles on trying to protect our eyes from the blowing sand. Oh yeah. And the entire crew is in the barn, you know, like kind of looking through a crack because the <laughs> sand went and they opened it for a split second. And I just looked at him. I said, everybody wants to direct, but nobody wants to be me right now. That's right. <laughs> And, Take note of this. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really, it was really, really a great, great experience. Great experience. And um, and and Stephen Lang and the entire cast was just remarkable. I mean that that guy, you know, he is just one of the finest actors. That I there totally is. agree. Do anytime he's in anything, I'm like, well, this is gonna be good. <laughs> I mean, Don't Breathe was nuts. Avatar, everything he does, it's just amazing. And it was cool to see him in a western with a top hat. You're like, all right, oh, he looked he looked great, and he nailed it. He he really he was great, and and he was so such a joy to work with, and and um, you know we we collaborated, and I was I was so um, I was so pleased um, to have him on the movie, and to for him to consider me a peer. You know, sure, sure. I mean, you can say you directed Stephen Lang. I mean, well, well done. I, why, you know, <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> you had the title at least around him you know what i mean but you can also see you directed you know christopher lloyd it's like dude it, these things are just racking up and i don't know how you contain yourself you know well done thanks i'm a lot you know I'm, i i i count my blessings I'm, i as i said I'm, I'm really the luckiest guy i've known and and i know and and uh every day is a good day yeah i believe it so how long was that shoot that was 18 days wow that's a lot of work it's a lot of work for 18 days. Yeah. It is a lot of work for 18 days. But, you know, we had the right team, and um, I don't think anything was, was, was sort of cut out. I think it all, it all worked. I didn't, you know, we had no pickup shots or anything. I didn't feel like it was lacking anything. Sure. That's a testament to the production itself. Yeah, we worked hard, and, and we got it done. And, and, um, and another funny thing about it is that, so Robert Carradine, his first job was in the Cowboys with John Wayne. What? I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, he was in the Cowboys with John Wayne, oh. and they shot it at they shot it at Bonanza Creek Ranch. So this time wow. Robert came back as the old guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> talk about full circle. And he had a yeah. great beard in that movie too. Yes. Like if I could grow that kind of a beard, I would just have it all the time. But I mean, granted, if I could get onto Bonanza Ranch, I'd probably live there all the time. Because who wouldn't? So actually, well, there's those... no there's no plumbing or electricity out there, so it's not really. Ooh, okay. Yeah, it's a set. You don't want to live. There. I take back what I said. Let's just yeah. I'll just edit that out. I'm not gonna edit that out. But so so you you made a good point. You said you had a meeting beforehand. So like, how I understand if you have a movie that you wrote and it's like your baby and you're making this come to fruition. 
But like, how does a director become attached to a project? Because I have no idea well, how that process works. Well, it um, you know, gosh, I don't really know how it works either. But <laughs> every now and then, uh, you know, I, I was just I, this meeting was set up, and so I went, I read the script, and then I went prepared. You know, I I basically had a uh, whatever, like kind of a PowerPoint, sure, know, a pitch, a pitch book of different Western images, and kind of explained how I would plan on bringing the script to life to oh, the producer. Okay. So showing like, some images and, and, and do you like directors have to also kind of, do they have to campaign for the movies they want to direct or do the projects find them? Be like, we oh, need a director. Yeah. I mean, it's, this? it's not a, well, both happens. Really? Um, but mo I mean, it's the thing that every, the old statement that everybody wants to direct really is true. Right. You know, it, I believe it. So it's, highly competitive i think the entertain the entire entertainment business is as competitive as professional sports i mean it's oh, i it's, believe it it's it's challenging even the biggest stars are you know are trying to get themselves attached to the best scripts right they're not sure they get they get offered things all the time but most of the things they get offered they don't want to do and there'd be some great piece of material and the hottest actors and actresses are kind of clawing their way to get to that that material so sure in my case, I, um, I, you know, constantly meet with people and talk and see what's, what's going on amongst the people that I know, which is a very limited circle, you know? Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I look, I look for work and, and thankfully every now and then work looks for me. There you go. That's the, that, I mean, that's the I mean, goal. The Western know? was that kind of thing where the, the executive that recommended me was a distributor and he rec, he said, you know, you should consider hiring you know richard gabby for this film he knows what he's doing and and he'll do a good job for you so they met with me so that one kind of found me and that happens every now and then and then you know insight was just organically developed by me and my team and then i you know raised the money and then we went out and sold it and everything worked out sure that's interesting like i i love the process and like learning about the things behind the things uh so that's very interesting because i i have a pretty basic understanding uh, having been acting for a few years, like the process of that, you know, what to watch out for, the pitfalls, and how it kind of works. But directing, I always wondered if it's like you find a script, and you're like, all right, I really like the script. I'm going to go talk to someone to try and get it funded and then make it. Or like, like the you know, there's the Director's Guild. Like <laughs> at one point, I believe that they just had like a bucket full of scripts, and they're like, all right, we need a director for this. Who wants to do it? And then they have a few, and all right, I'm going to pick you. You go take this and come back with a movie. Uh, it's just so foreign and secretive. Well, the director's bill doesn't find your work. I so. figured that later on. Yeah, it's a it, it's the it's the union, isn't it? It's like SAG for directors. Yeah, it okay. is. Yeah. Whew. I don't want to sound like a dumb dumb on my own show. <laughs> so uh, from there, um, I've seen a gingerbread romance, and it is Christmas in a movie. So I need to know how did you get involved in a Hallmark movie? Because Hallmark is like, it's Hallmark, dude. That's a, everybody knows a Hallmark movie. And yeah, I'm really, I'm work. extremely, extremely grateful to have gotten that opportunity. And it, I wanted to walk, work with Hallmark for a long time. Sure, I, I like what they do. And yeah, they're great. They're great at it, and and um, and you know, it's, it's a it's a brand and a feeling, and it's a, and and both are great. It's a I great agree. brand and a great family feeling. So. This executive that I worked with at another network for several movies, oh, um, Samantha DePippo, now works at Hallmark, and thankfully ah. she recommended me for the gig. Right on, and um, and I and I, I I got it, and I I watched about twenty uh, Hallmark Christmas movies right before I went to shoot this one. Smart, and um, worked with a great team out in Vancouver, and. Um, Wow, really lucky to work with Tia Mari and Dwayne oh, Henry. Dude, they're the and best, Melissa right? Melissa Peterman. Melissa Peterman is hilarious. Yes, she is. She's um, really, really funny. Yeah, like really funny. Yeah. <laughs> so it was great. I'm glad you liked the movie, and, and um, it's it's doing really well, and, and um, hopefully the first of many for Hallmark. Yeah, for sure. So with, so I uh, my my job job, is I deliver bulk orders of newspapers to like stores and hotels and stuff. 
And one of the places that I deliver to is the Ritz Carlton. And every year they do a giant gingerbread house. So when uh-huh. I watched the movie, I was like, hey, this is how it's made. Aha. Uh-huh. So how many gingerbread houses did you guys have to make? We made four giant gingerbread houses. Wow. Edible? Did you no. try it? Ah. Oh. <laughs> there you... were some there were some edible shingles. There you go. <laughs> there were some edible shingles, but um yeah, there it is it is um oh it's but an illusion. Uh, but all indeed. the cakes <laughs> all the cakes and cupcakes and cookies are all real and very delicious and oh you know, I'm um I was I was you know, I I was warned by my doctor that I was running very low on carbs. So I <laughs> ate I ate a lot of cookies and treats while I was making that film. Good man, and I had a blast on it. I can't, I can't wait to do another one. Yeah, I believe it. You did a really good job, and as I said, I'm a kid of the '90s, so Sister Sister was on all the time. So yeah, Tia Maro in anything is great. She just she seems is amazing. Like her, she's and amazing. Dwayne, she's she so is nice. a she is a star. Yeah, for sure. You can she's, just tell some people have it. You're like, oh, this is this is what they do. Very well done. And yep. her and Dwayne Henry both just seem like the nicest people, and they both are. That's so they, cool to hear. They sincerely and truly are just hardworking, good people. Dude, that's so cool. That's always what you want to hear. You know, you don't want to be like, oh, they were just awful on set. Did not work out. It's always great to hear that it's genuine. You know what I mean? Just kind of neat. Kind of neat. So do do you have... So actually, do you have any advice for like people coming up now? Because I feel like the industry is forever evolving. And there's like a million different ways to get in. So like for somebody who wants to do what you're doing uh, as far as directing or even acting, uh, do you have any advice for them? Man, I. Uh, it's a tough I one. Don't know. <laughs> if I was trying to get in now, I don't know what I would do. But then again, I'm not, you know, I'm not 22 again. So true. Um, true. I, I think the most important thing is to just really, you know, create content. I agree. And, and 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 make your own luck you know we kind of touched on it before you know the good news is now anyone can make a movie so there's really no excuse not to make one i agree i agree oh you know i want your opinion on something so uh when watching a movie right or any or any piece of content right a lot of people there's two uh frame of minds about it one of them is like the art speaks for itself but the other is there needs to be a level of technical quality as well you know what I mean? Like, would you want to watch a 480p quality movie versus a full HD? And how much does the story matter? And how much does the quality matter? As above, like, shooting on a phone versus shooting on, like, a DSLR. Does it matter? Well, first of all, phones are 2K now, so... Yeah, for real. Isn't that nuts? So it's just... It goes hand in hand. I mean, everyone knows you can't watch something that looks like crap. I agree. It's I agree. completely unacceptable. And, I mean, nobody, nobody will or can yeah, true. And but, time. And it's yeah. just, you know, there's nostalgia for VHS, but there's nostalgia for VHS for movies that were made in the 80s and 90s, not for That's true. Not for something <laughs> that now. I mean, if, if the concept warrants it, if it's brilliant, if it's everyone talks about still the Blair Witch Project or whatever the hell, you know. Right. Um, you know, if it if as long as the uh, punishment fits the crime, right? I totally agree. I totally agree. So how important do you... So from a director, that means you're involved in casting most of the time. So, like, how important is, like, the 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 rat race that is, like, reels versus headshots versus agents and management, like, with the internet being readily available? You know what I mean? Because you said anyone can make a movie, and with the internet, like, anyone can get your stuff out there as well. It's like, is there... Does it seem as, like, one lane now to get into the industry from the inside. Man, I don't know. Me neither. <laughs> I mean, acting is the most competitive business in the world. It is. There's millions of people going for the same thing. Yeah. I mean, and, and um, you know, I think it's that old thing. Let's put on a show. Look, what I, what I did with my first movies, it was me making movies starring with my friends. The difference was everyone couldn't do it, so you had to have a certain amount of just gut and grit to do it. I agree. You had to rent equipment, and you had to use a freaking lab and buy film and develop it, and it had to come out right. So everyone, and literally their grandmother, couldn't do it. So it was more unique to have a finished film. 
For sure. And, and when it got distributed, it had more meaning. So, you know, I don't necessarily know how to navigate the technicalities of this new world. I just know that if you don't make movies, you're not a filmmaker. And if you're not acting, you're not an actor. That so, is perfectly put. You are absolutely so right. That That's all I... It's all like that. All, all I could say about it. I no, I think that's all that needs to be said about it. That makes total sense. And it's and it also comes down to like anything freelance is on you. You know what I mean? Like you got to push that rock up the hill yourself. And it's like there's so much work ethic involved. Um, and I think hard work will always pay what you give into it. And you're a living testament to that. I mean, dude, you're killing it. You got a lot. You got a lot of things to be proud of, in my opinion. Well, thanks so much. Yeah. And then I, so I don't know if you can talk about this, but there's something I've been excited about since I heard about it six months ago, probably. What can you tell me about Kenzo? Um, I, uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you too much. Other than oh. I'm really excited about it, too. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, we're in soft prep. Um, it's something that I expect um, that we'll be shooting next year. Dude, I'm um, so excited. Peter Shinkoda is starring in it. Yes. It's a, it's a samurai western. Yes. You know, that's that's kind of that's kind of that's kind of all I can see at the moment. And hey, it's not funny. You know, it is funny because we're on the phone. We're we're, we're having this conversation. Uh -huh. And right now, Bobby Carradine is is, is calling me. Oh, tell him I said uh, hi too. <laughs> I will. I will. Dude, I'm so excited for Kenzo. You got Peter Shinkoda. That's Nobu. Peter's, <laughs> Peter's brilliant. And we we um. What's funny when I was in um. When I was in Vancouver shooting a gingerbread romance, he was in uh, in Vancouver working at the same time. We were staying at the same hotel, so oh sweet, <laughs> we got to grab drinks together a couple of times. He's an, an incredibly great dude and a brilliant actor, so oh, we're so all cool. very very excited about it. Good, good. Everyone needs to be looking out for that. I'm a huge samurai fan as well, and the fact that you have a samurai western, I was like, wow, it's my two favorite things in one. I'm pumped. There you go. And there the cast, go. dude, David Sakurai, Yuji Okamoto. Dude, you got oh, yeah. the guy from Karate Kid too. I know. Wow. I know. It's just it's one. You know, this thing is. I you know I, I hate to talk about things until they're until I'm literally saying action. Fair enough. Fair enough. Oh. I I'm excited, <laughs> and Good, I think too. you should be as well. And everyone needs to check out Gingerbread Romance. It's a great Hallmark movie. Thanks. We're well, really really proud of it. I know they're they're repeating it again uh, several times over the holiday season, and I'm sure. It'll be back next year, hopefully with maybe one or two Richard Gabby Hallmark movies before that. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So Me too. Can, can you believe we've been talking for over an hour already? I can. I'm getting kind of hungry. I got to go. <laughs> that is fair. Dude, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to, uh, to chat with me because, you know, you didn't have to. And I had a well, really I, good time. Me too. I, I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the fact that you um, – did your homework, or at least it wasn't homework. I think you kind of knew this stuff. I did know this stuff. I mean, it's easy when there's stuff out there, you know? Like you said, right. finish your movies, and I'll watch them. Uh, but where can people find you online if they want to reach out and tell yeah, you how they, awesome I, you are? I definitely, and I really, and I and I mean it sincerely, I really do enjoy um, interacting with, with, with people out there. I'm, well, I'm on Twitter, and I'm on Instagram, and yep. I'm on Facebook. Good man. And, um, and on my website richardgabby.net um there's a little box where you can just sort of send me a message that comes to my email Perfect. but i i check everything i would just say that i'm you know i'm um i'm least savvy on twitter you know i still don't understand all that tweeting stuff i gotta yeah. be honest with you. <laughs> hashtag hashtag yeah. what that's right yeah <laughs> um, but i'm on there and um and 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 yeah through my website and, and my album my double life album yes is streaming on all the services you can stream it for free right um, and if you happen to be interested in an old school cd you can order one of those from my website but there's no need i mean it's streaming everywhere so give the album a listen I, I, i'm really excited about the album and um love getting feedback on, on everything. I love being in touch with people. And if anyone has a question, they can send me a message on the website or through Facebook or whatever. Facebook, I sometimes get blocked. I don't know how that works, but yeah. <laughs> it, um, it happens. <laughs> whatever. I, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely reachable. I'm all over the place. There you go. I like it. Dude, this was great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day, Brian. You Thanks too. For, the, for the time and, and, uh, 
Only good times. All the best. That's right. Anytime. Best of luck with everything, my friend. Take care. All Bye. right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it is at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian all over the place. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all Jedi Brian. If you enjoyed this episode, please share and tell your friends. Let them know we got some cool stuff going on over here. Also, I've gone and made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash Jedi Brian. On that note... Special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, and Daryl. Your support means everything, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.